Hi everyone, today we're going to delve a little bit further into how species are related. We're going to look specifically in this presentation at how we can compare the DNA of different organisms and look at their biochemistry to help us to figure out relationships or how related they are. So determining relatedness. What does it mean to be related? So in a biological sense, the relatedness refers to how recently species have split from a common ancestor. It's really vital for us to know that and be able to define that um, because we'll have many questions that come up on a SAC or an exam where we'll need to be able to explain the relatedness between species. So that definition is important. So we can see on this little chart here, we've got species A, species C, D, and B. They've all diverged from a common ancestor um, at different points. So B has diverged earlier, or he's diverged to be on his own before the divergence, which has led to D, and then subsequently the divergence, which has led to C and A. So if we were to say which of these organisms are most commonly related, we would say that C and A are the most commonly related because they've got the most recent common ancestor. So that black dot there is showing a recent common ancestor. Okay. If we were to think about who is the most commonly related or the most closely related to B, we need to go back, look at the point of the most recent point of divergence, which would be right here. So we would say that D is the most closely related to B. There's a few ways that we can determine relatedness. We can compare proteins. We can compare nuclear DNA. So DNA that's found inside our cells, inside the nucleus. We can compare mitochondrial DNA, which is DNA which is found inside a cell, inside our mitochondria or we can compare the entire genome. Remembering a genome is um, a word which describes the, all of the genes present in an organism's, organism. This table here compares um, or is a comparison between pairs of related species that differ um, in the time since they've shared a common ancestor. So it shows us how we can look at amino acid sequence, how we can look at DNA to DNA hybridization, so looking at comparing the DNA. Um, we can look at base sequences of nuclear DNA or mitochondrial DNA. We can look at cytogenic structures, we can look at chromosomes and how they are similar and we can do chromosome painting, which is best basically where we look at the karyotypes and how different and similar they are between um, organisms. We can compare the anatomy um, of organisms of different species over time to look at how, um, how we've seen the development of modern day organisms. So anatomy relates to the physical structure of an organism. When comparisons are made between anatomies of different species, it can often be seen that although the structures have evolved to fulfill different functions or different purposes, these structures still have the same evolutionary origins. So atomic structures with similar genetic origins that have resulted from divergent evolution are what we refer to as homologous structures.
So these structures here are all homologous. Humans use an arm um, to do what we need to do to hold our pen to allow for movement. Um, horses have got their front legs and so do cats, um, which although they are different size, you can see that they've retained the same bones. A whale, um, its fins also retain two short bones, which show evidence of a common um, ancestral, um, common ancestor, I should say. And the same with bats, although they've evolved to have wings and fly, they still re retain those same two structures, um, which allow it to complete its function. Some organisms also have vestigial organs and structures. So these um, organs or structures were once useful to the species, but they no longer have a purpose now. So an example um, of this is the species ratolites, which still have wings, although they can't fly. Another example is the pelvis and femur of a whale. So we know that our pelvis and femur, our pelvis holds our, our leg bones in place basically, and our femur is the largest leg bone at the top where your thigh is. Um, in humans, they're really prominent, but in a whale, which no longer is a land dwelling creature, though it has origins um, of, of being that, um, it's pelvis and femur. They still have little tiny bones um, that develop in their structure, but they've got no use. Okay, another example um, of a stigial organ in a human is our appendix. Appendix used to be important when humans' um, diet was much more plant-based, but they're not used anymore, and that's why they can be removed without um, impacting on us. Um, analogous structures. These structures are said to be um, arisen from convergent evolution. So these structures are basically um, where animals look like they've got similar sort of similar structures, but they haven't um, emerged from a common ancestor. Rather, they've come about due to the change in the environments and these animals moving to a more similar environment. So they've been impacted by um, the same selective pressure and they'll adapt to survive in these conditions via the process of natural selection. So a fish, a penguin, and a dolphin all live around the sea. They've all got this, um, either a wing or a flipper, I suppose, um, but they haven't come from the same ancestor. They've just developed these structures due to the natural selection process and the, as a result of the different selective pressures in their environment. So the opposite to what we just looked at with homologous structures. We can use comparative embryology to compare the embryos of different organisms because you'll often find that organisms go through similar stages of embryonic development and this um, is said to be evidence that they're closely related. So for example, humans have gill-like structures during early development. That's why um, a fetus can exist um, in utero, which is a totally fluid environment um, before they're born. Here's some more examples of comparative embryology. So regardless of whether or not um, these structures are present um, in, in adults, which many of them are not, all vertebrates display the following features at least some stage during their embryonic development. So all vertebrates of which we are will have some sort of a tail during embryonic development. Um, they'll have a little um, nodule at the um, on their backbones. Okay, they'll have a hollow nerve cord. They'll have um, these little arches, which give rise to gills that we just spoke about. So just here. Okay, so those little arches um, might lead to gills in some organisms, but they also might need, lead to jaw, lower jaws, faces, and ears in other organisms. So they're all common to vertebrates. Um, which show that we all have evolved from a common ancestor, but based on um, our selective pressures and what the function of an organism and what it's required to do, they'll develop differently in those organisms. Okay, there's a little bit of other evidence that we're going to have a look at. Okay, the first one is biochemistry. So since heredity information of an individual is located in genes, 
we would expect that the more closely related individuals are, the more similar their DNA and then their proteins would be. So we can compare DNA and amino acid sequences between different organisms to see how related they are. So if we've got a um, sequence of DNA from a human and a chimp, we would expect them to be quite similar because those two organisms um, have, own, have evolved separately from each other over, only over recent times. If we were to look at this little graph here, we can see that the chimp and the human are quite close. But if we were to compare um, the DNA of a human compared to the DNA of a baboon, we would see that they would be more different because they've diverged, they've evolved separately from an ancestor, which was um, a longer time ago. So the more similar or the more um, closely related species are, the more similar their DNA and amino acid sequences are. The further away or the more distant the relationship is between two animals, the more different an amino acid sequence would be. So for example, humans and chimpanzees, very similar. Humans and dinosaurs would be very different. This is just a graphic here comparing amino acid sequences from a human, a chimpanzee, a gorilla, a mouse, an ancestor, and a horse. So you can see that um, while some similarities are retained between all of them, the more closely or the more close the closer the sequences are to matching, the more closely related they will be. Um, so species that are more closely related would be expected to have fewer differences in their amino acid sequence and then the corresponding proteins that they produce would be more um, distinctly related. Okay, The longer the periods since two species diverged from a common ancestor, the more time that's passed and therefore the more different or the more changes we would expect to see in the proteins that are present in those organisms. So we can see a little chart down in the corner here, which look at the difference in amino acid sequences in cytochrome C. Okay, so we know cytochrome C is present in the electron transport chain um, and it's important during respiration. So in humans, we're looking at the number of different amino acids. They've got um, none that are based, they've got very, very few um, compared to a rhesus monkey. A whale has got many more differences in the number of amino acids compared to the human. A chicken has many more than a whale and a fish has many more than a human. So we can see here that as we go um, along this chart, the fish and the human would be the most distantly related the rhesus monkey and the human would be the most closely related because they've only got less than five differences in the number of amino acids for that particular cytochrome C molecule. This is just a little chart which shows the number of differences in amino acid sequence um, that produces the molecule hemoglobin, which is important in our blood. So if we're to have a look at a couple of little questions here, which of the species is most closely related to humans? Okay, so humans, chimps have got no differences. Their hemoglobin structure is exactly the same as a human. So we would say the chimp is the most closely related to the human. Which species is the least closely related? That would be the mollusk. It's got 127 differences. So that molecule of hemoglobin is going to be totally different in a mollusk compared to a human. Are we more closely related to a mouse or kangaroos based on this protein? So here is a mouse, here is a kangaroo. A mouse has got 27 differences and a kangaroo has got 38 differences. So if we were looking at this protein, the one with the least number of differences compared to the human would be the mouse. So that we would say in this particular, for this particular protein, we're more closely related to a mouse than we are to a kangaroo. DNA comparisons. Okay, this is the same principle as the protein comparisons. Rather than looking at differences in 
um, amino acid structure, we're now directly comparing the DNA base sequence um, of a gene or comparing the whole genome, which remember is a collection of all the genes that make up an organism. We're not going to look at DNA hybridization because that's not part of our 2020 study design, but we will have a tiny little look at a karyotype but I'm going to hedge my bets and say that this is probably not something that we're going to be assessed on in the exam. But let's just get our head around it because we never know. So when we're directly comparing the DNA, and we've seen this slide in a previous presentation, the, the more similar the chains are, the more closely related the species are. Okay, so here we can see that the human and the primate um, they have got very, very few differences. So if we go through A, T, G, got one difference here. A, C, G, C, A, T, G, C. They have only got one difference in their DNA sequence. If we look now at the human compared to a horse, A, A, T, T, G, G, C, they've got a difference here. A, T, they've got a difference here. G, G, C, C. A, A, T, C, difference here, three differences. Okay, so the more differences that you have in your DNA sequence, um, the further or the less closely related we are. There's a couple more examples here. So this shows um, some species, J, K, L, M, M N, um, and it shows the differences in their DNA sequences from this we've been able to draw a little tree which visually shows the point of divergence or the um, relatedness of the species. So we can see here um, that we've got all of our species. We can see that we've only between sort of J and K, there's only a, a few differences. Okay. So we've got one difference um, between these two. And then you can see as we go through this more and more differences. So species J diverges much earlier from the rest of the different species. And we look at the number of different differences in the amino acid sequence to help us to be able to position these other species appropriately. So L and M are very similar. So if we were to look at L and M, we can see that their sequences are almost identical. There's only a couple of little differences between them. So even as I'm going through looking at the sequence now, I'm finding it really tricky to be able to find a difference at all. So they've only got one difference between them in terms of bases, whereas the others, they would have more differences. Comparing genomes or comparative genomics, as it's sometimes referred to, okay, because the amount of data is so large, because humans have got about 300, so sorry, 3,000 million base pairs, computer technology is what we use to be able to study um, or compare the genomes. So information gained from comparative ge genomics has applications in medicine and industry. So by comparing genomes of living species, we can identify the degree of relatedness between different species um, from a fraction of the genes that they share that are similar and we can make inferences about the phylogeny or the evolutionary history of a species based on these differences. So basically all we're doing in this technique, which is um, totally computerized, um, is taking a blood test from um, a couple of from two different people, for example, um, or two different species, one from a human and one from a chimp. And then we're comparing those to see which are more similar or how similar they are. This is just a little diagram here, which shows the similarities or the percentage of human DNA that can be aligned um, with 12 vertebrate species. So um, in a chimpanzee here, the orange bar is showing um, something that's not annotated. Then we've got, um, which would be junk DNA. Then we've got a blue part, which is DNA sequences that are repetitive. We've got UTRs, okay, which were um, untranslated regions, and we've got coding regions. Um, so we can see that all of those organisms have got coding regions, but all of the other um, sections or 
or categories of DNA differ. We can also compare chromosomes. So chromosomes from different species can be compared to help us to identify um, or can by, be identified by looking at chromosome banding patterns or the use of chromosome painting. Let's unpack those. So chromosome banding is when you look at the different patterns to determine the relatedness between species. So for example, chimps, gorillas and orangutans have um, their versions of chromosome 2 um, in two separate parts. And after the evolution of humans, um, some, something may have occurred that has caused them to fuse together, creating one long chromosome. So we can see here that there's a variation in the size of those chromosomes between the different organisms. And the banding patterns are those little colored bands on the side. So we can compare those patterns to help us to um, look at an evolutionary origin. We can also use chromosome painting, um, which is basically known as multicolored spectral karyotyping, where we color chromosomes to give us a more sort of visual representation and we can compare those chromosomes um, to see how related species are. So here's an example um, of chromosomes from a wallaby that are painted with chromosome paints for chromosomes of the same colored, sorry, for chromosomes of a bush, a common bush-tailed possum. So by doing this, we're able to see which parts of the karyotype or, or which parts of the chromosome or which chromosomes are similar between those two different species. And again, the more similar um, they are, the more related the species are, the less similar, the less related. And finally, we can also use mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondrial DNA is found in the mitochondria. It's different to nuclear DNA in that it only codes for genes that are relevant to the functioning of the mitochondria. So. <clears throat> the genes um, in mitochondrial DNA, they only impact the function of the mitochondria, not anything else or no other proteins that are necessary for um, other parts of the body. Um, this DNA evolves relatively quickly, but at a known rate. So there is little difference between mitochondrial DNA of parent and offspring. So as a result, it's used to um, establish or the extent of relatedness between species as well as the lineage of a species, because mitochondrial DNA is inherited down the maternal line. So your mother will pass on her mitochondrial DNA to you. That mitochondrial DNA would have come from her mother, or your grandmother, which would have come from her mother, your great grandmother. So because it's passed down the maternal line, um, most cells contain many copies um, of mitochondrial DNA as well. That's another um, advantage. So it um, mutates at a rate that's known, which is usually slower than nuclear DNA. And the fact that it's inherited down the line allows us to be able to um, compare quite well.